my Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you hear, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. There is one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Lord Jesus Christ, these were your words to that rich young man who we read about in today's gospel. And Jesus, every time I read this passage, I cannot help but think about one of the most powerful documents of the recent magisterium. And I refer to the document of St. John Paul II, which is the Veritati Splendor, or On the Splendor of Truth, in which the Holy Father reflects on the whole of the Church's moral teaching. And I think that it is important that we all we recall fundamental truths of Catholic doctrine. In this encyclical, the Holy Father uses precisely this conversation of the rich young man and you, Lord Jesus, to expound the clear traditional moral doctrine of the Catholic Church. Going back to this Gospel passage, the first thing that I noted, Jesus, is that this man ran up and knelt before you, and then he asked you that question, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And dear Lord, I thought that this is the kind of question everyone asks, which is the question about the meaning of life. In fact, in his encyclical, the Holy Father says that this man questions Jesus about morality that leads ultimately to the question about the full meaning of life. I mean, don't we all long for that ultimate fulfillment? A desire for an absolute good. Jesus, you then replied to the question of this man when you said, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Interesting answer. No one is good but God alone. What did you mean by that, Jesus? John Paul II gives an answer that perhaps will help us in this time of prayer. He says that only God can answer the question about what is good, because he is the good itself. And he explains this further by saying that to ask about the good, in fact, ultimately means to turn towards God, the fullness of goodness. And Jesus, not only did you do good, but you are goodness itself. You did indeed do lots of good when we see you healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, loosening the tongue of the mute, opening the ears of the deaf, and the people around you looked at you and marveled and said, He has done all things well. Jesus, you then go on to give an answer. You say, you know the commandments, and you list the commandments. So the first basic answer to that question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, is keep the commandments. And this fits in very well with your words in another context when you say, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Therefore, Jesus, you make it very clear that in order to love you, we need to do what you tell us. And Jesus, this is so important, especially in a time in which Religion has been reduced to the sentimental. In other words, it means that we have to have God as the first object of our love. No idols, no taking his name in vain, keeping the Lord's Day holy, sanctifying that, going to Mass, getting to Mass on Sundays and holidays of obligation. Once we center our lives on God, then the others will be easier to live. These are the commandments that have to do with neighbor. And therefore we love our parents. We show respect to those in authority. We respect and love life. No murder, no abortion. We reject all sins of the flesh, in body, in mind. We strive to always tell the truth and respect the property of the others. All these are ways of loving our Lord in very concrete terms. And so Jesus 
help me to always cooperate with your grace and also to grow in virtue, to abhor, to hate sin and to embrace truth, goodness, beauty, to be ready to leave the supernatural virtues to a heroic degree and perhaps more and more as our culture becomes more estranged from you. Then Jesus, what I find remarkable is the fact that this man says, Master, I have kept all this from my early days. Amazing! And I'm thinking to myself, this truly is incredible, is heroic. And my thoughts are confirmed by you because you looked at him steadily and you loved him. Then you drop that bomb that we began with in our prayer. When you tell him, there is one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Commenting on these, your words, Lord. John Paul II says, This vocation to perfect love is not restricted to a small group of individuals. And therefore to think that I am excluded from the demands of the gospel. Yet you have called all of us, all of us, to that perfection because elsewhere in the gospel you say, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so John Paul II says that the invitation, Go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and that promise that you will have treasure in heaven, are meant for everyone because they bring out the full meaning of the commandment of love for neighbor, just as the invitation which follows, come follow me, is the new, specific form of the commandment of love for God. And the vast majority of us live in the middle of the world, living ordinary lives, doing ordinary stuff, and yet we are not exempt from this demand of love. Love for God and love for neighbor for the sake of God. Therefore, again, we go back to that question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And we can summarize the answer as keeping the commandments, being detached from everything, every possession, and to follow you closely by doing your will, obeying your will, and following you in whatever path you choose to lead us, be it in holy matrimony or in apostolic celibacy. Speaking of apostolic celibacy, I like to recall the story of the life of a brilliant young man who had so many possibilities, yet he gave everything for the sake of the kingdom of God, for the sake of the apostolate, and his name was Tony Zweifel. He was born in Verona in Italy, He spent the first years of World War II in Switzerland with his mother and younger sister, Anna Rosa. And just mentioning the war, I think it is important to recall the plea that the Holy Father Pope Francis has made for us to pray for Ukraine, for peace, peace in Ukraine, peace in the world. Towards the end of his studies, through some fellow students, he came into contact with Opus Dei on March 19th of 1962, he requested admission to Opus Dei as a numerary member, which means that he was a celibate member. He went on to excel in his professional life, as well as help many young people through the apostolate that he did with them. He was totally available to the needs of the prelature of Opus Dei. In 1985, both of his parents died, his father in May and his mother in August. And in the following year, on February 19th, Tony learned that he was suffering from leukemia, for which he underwent chemotherapy treatment. After a temporary return to health, he suffered a first relapse in February of 1988, and the second the following year in November. In June 1989, he had to enter the hospital once more and undergo more chemotherapy. He died on November 24th, 1989, and is buried in Zurich. Mary, my mother, teach me to give myself completely to Christ, to God's will. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into practice. 
my Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.